planned this. Oh, everyone, we are recording. So I don't have to remember to tell you. Thank you. Um, when we were doing our planning for this, you know, we sit down, you know, sometimes minutes, no, months in advance and talk about what our topics are going to be. And when we said, let's do one of the web webinars and just focus on tough conversations. It's a class that we offer. We're getting a lot of pull for it from customers. I made the, the offhanded remark. I'm like, oh, it's going to be wildly popular. And, and we have been joking about wildly popular kind of tongue in cheek for a while. And then we opened registration and it was indeed wildly popular um, enough that we had to upgrade our web platform. We we're thrilled to have so many people joining us and so many people registered, um, but it did cause us to have to switch the link. So we're, we're sorry for that, but we're also thankful for everything we learned in that process. And I imagine people will continue to trickle in and join us. Um, the reason that, that my intuition and that wildly popular phrase came up, and it's a joke, but it's not a joke, is we have been teaching forms of this topic for a very long time. And what we've observed is every time you offer a crucial conversations, a tough conversations, a class that's in that, you know, in that bubble, you will get wildly popular attendance because everyone wants to learn the secret. I, 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 I tell myself a story that, you know, if there's something in that class that will make these things easier, I want to be in there. Right. And so people want to take a class to learn how to do it. And the truth is tough conversations are always going to be tough, even for the well-trained, even for people going to the class, nothing that you're going to sit in a classroom or even on this webinar that you can learn will take away the tough part of the conversation. And we're going to talk about in this webinar, why that is. So um, we are excited you are all here. We are anxious to share with you what you know. We want you to start having these conversations. We're going to talk about what it means to business. Um, but first, for those of you, we do have a lot of new people here. So let's go ahead. Um, for those of you that don't know us, first time meeting Slingshot, welcome. Um, we are, let's go to the next one. Uh, oh, yeah. So if you have questions throughout the uh, session, I think I... Sorry, Kim, I think I, I think mine's a little outdated, so I'm going to go with you on these first two slides. Um, if you have a question throughout the conversation, put it in the Q&A. If we don't get to it in the call, we will, um, maybe we can address it in a follow-up or in our newsletter. But yeah, we're welcome to hear from you. We are, we, we, we like hearing and appreciate for those of you that chimed in in the early part of the call. Uh, it's really helpful to hear how you all are thinking about this, what you want to learn more about, what you notice. So use Q&A. We like that. Um, we like to be in dialogue here. So um, for those of you that don't know us, we are Slingshot 25. Our um, primary areas of focus, the things we help clients with are change management and communication, team performance, and leader training. And this conversation is kind of rooted in all of these things. You end up having to have tough conversations when things change. You definitely have to have tough conversations when your teams aren't performing and every leader, a core part of your training is figuring out how to show up, be vulnerable, be empathetic and get in conversations with your people. So that's what we're about. That's what we do. We are thrilled you're here. Nice to meet us. Um, a little bit about our history. We have been doing this work, whether it's teaching leaders or managing change or helping teams perform for the better part of 20 years in corporate. And we are, mm, I was going to say committed, but like we're probably a little more crazy than committed. Like we believe in creating sustainable change. There is so much work that goes on in the world, kind of at a surface level. And what we're about at Slingshot, what we've learned in 25 years of being in corporate, trying to help leaders, trying to help organizations, is that you've got to get to the root of how leaders think in order to change your business. And we've been applying things, we've been learning, we've been doing this a long time, and we absolutely love helping our clients create change that will last, change that that um, makes a difference that you can actually like you leave a dent in what you do. And, and we get to do that because we, we have strong corporate backgrounds. We've done the work in a lot of different ways, and we're just having a blast helping people by leveraging our, our scars, if you would, um, helping their teams perform and helping their leaders be better and help them navigate change. So, um, 
And we're very serious about helping people with this. So from a content perspective, we are, um, and we encourage you to follow us online. We offer a lot of free videos, tools, webcasts. We do thought partnership with our, with our shot cast, we call it. Um, this stuff is free. So if you're not following us online, like do it. You get to see Jackie do Jack Jet. And like I work with her every day and it still makes me laugh. Um, and these free tools are out there that there's nothing that stops you right now from running a Jack Chat at your next team meeting and creating a conversation that helps your team focus on being better leaders. Leverage the stuff we get you, invite your friends to our webinars, get on our newsletter. Because um, if, you, if you're interested in being a good leader, if you're interested in managing change, if you're interested in helping your team perform, there's stuff out there for you right now that you can use. So go get that. Um, all right. All that stuff's free. I love it. Um, okay, so let's move into the tough conversations. So I think it's always helpful when we talk about one of these topics. We, we teach a class on tough conversations um, and we just want to bring you a snippet of some of the highlights of that so that you can start to wrestle with this in your own teams, maybe take away a few ideas. That's what the next hour is about. And we like to ground these conversations in, you know, share with you what we know about it. So when we bring up tough conversations in our office, we run a business, we have a team. The first thing that happens in our team is we all smirk because of how I handle tough conversations, how Jackie handles tough conversations. Um, Jackie and I worked together a long time, Kim Garrett as well. Um, the smirk is because Jackie and I sit, if there's a continuum, we sit on very, on the opposite ends of the spectrum. Like we just could not sit further apart. I am um probably I'm on the side of like, have the tough conversation. Like, let's get in there. Let's not sit on this. Let's move. Let's get it out and talk about it. And so, um, I'm not going to tell a story about a very specific tough conversation, but I think what I do want to share as an anchor point is even as the person who is kind of known in our office to be the tough conversation tackler, who historically on our teams is like, Hey, that needs said, like Courtney will do it, right? I don't know if there's a Mikey will eat it kind of thing going on there, but I'm very willing to have tough conversations. I'm going to smirk because maybe I enjoy it. I don't know if there's a sadist part of that. I don't know what that is, but, but the truth is like, even as someone who's well-practiced, who's depended on by the team to address things, I still wrestle with like, I still get the pit in my stomach. I still hate it. I still, um, spend a lot of time chewing on and playing out scenarios in my head about how is this conversation going to go earlier? It, well, you know, in the pre conversation, um, someone said like, you don't want to hurt that other person's feelings. Like I have Woo in my strengths. I need people to like me. A tough conversation scares me as much as anyone else because, and, and in some ways, probably more so because I have a core need in my values to be liked. Um, tough conversations are, are very scary to that part of my values because I don't want to damage a relationship. And so, and all that being said, I am very willing to have them because I just believe that we can't move forward. We can't get work done if something's, if, if something's like kind of looming out there and, and eating at the team or eating at the relationships. Um, so even for people that are, are well-versed, right? Like I have a, I have a, if there's a belt with little, you know, tabs, I have a fair number of tough conversations under my belt a lot. Um, the last one I can think of, I had to have, I bet I spent, well, an embarrassingly amount of time wrestling through, I, I worked with a coach um, to prepare for that conversation, a coach that wasn't Jackie, um, because I need to get my thoughts right. I need to get my values right. I need to get my head right that I, I had told myself this, there was no way to have this conversation without hurting the other person. And that wasn't true. And I needed some help getting that squared away. 
So um, that's one end of the spectrum. Um, Jack, what's the other end of the spectrum? Well, I think you're implying that I'm the other end of the spectrum. I think you so, are the other end of the spectrum. So let me talk from this side of the spectrum. Um, for those of you who are listening to Courtney, some of you may be identifying with her of like, yeah, I'm that person that the minute I start to recognize that something needs to be said, like, I got to get moving on that. I have to have that conversation because the sitting in that space is so uncomfortable for me that um, that it's, I don't want to say it's easy for me, but I'm definitely drawn to, to speak up and say something. Um, now that of course, as Courtney just described, it comes with, um, you know, comes with things to, to consider um, and things that can make you better at being in that space. That's what we're here to talk about. On the other side of the spectrum though is me, which is the first thing that starts happening to me when I realize a tough conversation needs to be had is I'm thinking of every possible reason uh, for not having the conversation. And um, I have, I've had to really, I, I've had to really work through that. And I think it's one of the reasons that I am, um, you know, that, that, that I teach this class <laughs> because of my own history with being really challenged with, um, with these conversations. So I, I as, as I was preparing for this conversation today, I was thinking about one particular I guess, episode of tough conversations that, I, that I've had in my past. Those who know me know that I've been, um, you know, beaten around this corporate space for about 30 years. And I spent a fair amount of that time as a leader myself. So I'm going to ask you to think back to the mid 1990s. Um, and I was a relatively young leader. And if I was a remote leader, Think about that, mid 1990s, I had an entirely remote team. I sat in one office in Cedar Rapids, Iowa, and all of my direct reports were somewhere else in the, in the, in the country. And I was challenged with a particular employee that was not in the same city as me. So all of this was remote. And um, there was, she, was, uh, she was doing some things that were causing real serious problems for the team that surrounded her in the city where she was. And I knew I had to address it. Um, of course, you know, I made a lot of mistakes in, in addressing this. The first mistake that I made was I, of course, stepped over the molehill of the problem for like, you know, six months before it was suddenly a mountain. Anyone, I, I'm guessing that some of you can relate to that. Wait till the, you know, wait till the mountain is so big, you need Sherpas and oxygen tanks to address it um, instead of just tackling it head on when it's, when it was probably much easier to deal with. So I, I waited for the mountain, ignore the molehill. That was the first mistake I made. The second mistake that I made was I didn't prepare. I did not prepare for the conversation. And I remember, I can remember to this day, like, of course I was on the phone. We didn't have Zoom back then. Didn't have much of any anything in the way of video conferencing. Um, so I was so on light, the phone. So Jackie. <laughs> totally dating myself. Um, <laughs> so I'm on the phone with her and I can remember that um, she used to use this this way of saying like, you know, well, Jack, you got to remember, you got to remember, you got to remember. Now, I, I now understand why she was saying all of that. And we're going to talk about that here in a bit. But um, I lost my cool. Those of you who know me might find that surprising, but I lost my cool. I got very upset. And I can just remember saying, if you give me one more thing, I have to remember. <laughs> just like, like, it was I know it was, it was spicy. It was not good. And I, um, and I just remember her like coming back with, yeah, okay. I think we need to end this conversation. <laughs> she was right. Uh, so I stepped back, I cooled off and, um, that was where I really started thinking about how do you do this thing? How do you do these tough conversations? And then so naturally using all of my other strengths, I started on a journey of actually figuring it out of reading about it, practicing, understanding the psychology of it. And I ultimately ended up being certified in crucial conversations. I know many of you have probably um, been a part of that kind of programming in the past. Um, so I learned a lot about how to have these kinds of conversations. And um, and then I, I, you know, I, I made that situation, I, I made that situation much better. Essentially, here's here's what I ended up learning from that, and then we'll we'll kind of dig in and move into. So, where does the learning go from here? Um, I learned number one, and so maybe this is something that will help all of you. That 
I don't control the other person and I have to let that go. I mean, that maybe that sounds like kind of obvious, but it doesn't feel obvious in the moment, does it? You just so badly want the other person to get it, to see it, to change their, to change their behavior, to do something different, but just letting it go. So I learned that her behavior wasn't my responsibility. What she chose to do was not my responsibility. However, I was accountable to the outcomes of her behaviors. That I had to own as the, as the leader, I had to own that. And I accepted that. But to let go that I don't control the other person's behavior. The, uh, so that was one big thing that I learned. I stopped trying to control the uncontrollable. The second thing that I learned was um, to prepare. To prepare. I hadn't prepared. And so to prepare, and, and we'll talk about some things that you can do to prepare um, to help ditch the drama and stay focused on objectives. That's the whole point of preparing is to think through it before you have the conversation. Now, the conversation will still be the Wild West, right? You just never know what the other person is going to say. But when you get yourself grounded in the purpose of the conversation so that you can remind yourself of why you're here, who you serve, and why you serve them, the preparation is what you need to, um, to, you know, to stay grounded in all of that. So those are the two big things that I learned from my first foray into having a tough conversation. Um, and and I, I learned a lot and I've continued to learn a lot in the last 25 odd years since that time. And so that's, let's dig in and take a look at um, some of what I've learned that I'm now sharing with you. Yeah. Jax, thanks. Thanks for that. We didn't, we don't share our stories before we tell them. So that that's really helpful. Interesting. Jackie loses her temper. That's what I heard. <laughs> I Never did. seen it. So why it matters. Okay. I think there is, we kind of intuitively get that when any, if there's anything going on that we, that we, that we should deal with and we leave it alone, it festers. And I, I I'm a very visual person. So all of you who haven't cleaned out your refrigerator for a while, there's a reason that you don't look forward to that job, right? Because it doesn't matter what it is. If it's been sitting there and needed a dress and it wasn't, the longer it sits, the worse it gets. And so there is a very strong business benefit to dealing with things when they come up. And the longer it waits, the harder it is, the more damage that can happen. And so if you think about the space between the first time, you know, should you should address something and, and when you actually go and do something about it, waiting never helps. It's not, it doesn't get easier the longer you wait. And so we want to have these tough conversations so that we can improve relationships, you know, or flip that even like we don't want to damage them. We want that team health. We want that trust. And we want to address issues while they're small, right? If you put something in the refrigerator and you have a habit of cleaning out every week, whatever your, you know, whatever leftovers you need, aren't that big a deal to deal with. But if it's a month later, you're like, oh, when was Christmas? And this is left from there, bigger problem. The same thing happens with tough conversations. And the thing that I kind of want to throw in here is, is the benefits of having the courage to face the conversation. If you have the faith and belief that liberation is never a one-way street, right? Like when we step up and do the right thing for the relationships, we do the right thing for the team, we do the right thing for the company. We are also helping the person. We are helping the person and that liberation is never a one-way street. If you speak your truth, if you speak the company's truth, if you see the team's truth, the person that's on the other side of it is also hearing what they need to hear, even if it's hard. And, and I think that that sometimes really is work to believe that like we just tell ourselves like well if if we do this thing that's that's hard for us that person's going to suffer no matter what it's not always true it's actually it's never true liberation is always good for both sides in the long run we just got to get through the conversation so jackie what makes it so tough hmm. Well, of course, we were asking you that question um, as we got started today, and thank you for all your responses. I have read through those, and you're all right. 
of what makes the tough conversation so tough. But I'd like to point out, I, I love finding what I call the truth at the bottom of everything. I'm always looking for that. I'm always looking for the pattern and the sort of the core of what's true. And I'd like to point out what I think is similar about all of your responses to us about what makes tough conversations so tough for you in one word, uh, feelings. Feelings are what make it so tough. You guys have, I know, I mean, I know some of you, I'm recognizing a lot of names who are joining us today. And I know you do really hard work, like really hard technical work. Um, you could probably blow my mind with the things that you know about engineering and chemistry and, and systems and projects. You could blow my mind and you'll have hard conversations about that gnarly stuff all day long and never bat an eye. But it's tough to talk to someone about the fact that they're not doing dishes in the kitchenette. Um, and why? Why is that so hard? Because of feelings. That's the big answer here. Feelings are what makes tough conversations so tough. You name some feelings. Feelings like they're going to be sensitive. So that means you're going to feel awkward, doesn't it? They're going to be squirming when the other per the person you're talking to, they might be defensive. That's uncomfortable for me. Um, they, you don't want to hurt someone. You feel bad about hurting someone. You might feel, mm, what's that term like guilty, right? Guilty or ashamed. Those are all feelings. You mentioned the words, uh, some of you mentioned the word insecure. I'm very insecure about what if I say something stupid? What if I get embarrassed? What if I say something that gets me in trouble? So Kim Garrett, let's take us a couple slides ahead here. So what makes tough conversations so tough? The answer is essentially feelings. So let's dig into where this feeling stuff comes on the next slide. We're gonna take a look at a famous study. I love talking about this study because it taught us so much. Um, some of you have may have noticed that I reference this a lot because there was so much to be learned about human behavior. Um, I'm guessing that there's many people um, in this meeting that have that know this know about this study. It, it makes you know it's it's classic study for Psych 101 in college. This was the Stanley Milgram study. It was conducted in 1961 at Yale University. It's a study that could not be done today. Um, sort of, you know, uh, ethics would 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 intervene and prevent you from doing a study like this. Let me just do a really quick recap of what this study was for those of you who um, are not familiar with it or maybe have forgotten about it since your Psych 101 days. So the purpose of the study, you have to remember the time that this was done. In 1961, we were just about 15 years out from World War II, where, of course, World War II shocked the world with some of the things that human beings were able to do to other human beings. And we couldn't understand how that happened. How did seemingly normal, quote unquote, normal people uh, commit such atrocities against their neighbors? And so Stanley Milgram set out to try to find out why that happened. He was essentially looking for why were people so obedient? And um, so these were called the obedience studies. And here's how they worked. You're looking at a picture right now of an actual artifact from that study. This is an electric shock panel. So it's probably coming back to some of you right now. Um, the way this experiment worked is they brought um, they brought participants in and they randomly divided them into, you're going to be a teacher and you're going to be a learner. And the teacher's job was to sit in front of a panel that looked like this, while the learner's job was to go on the other side of the wall into a room um, that they, the, the, the teacher couldn't see them, but the teacher could hear them. That was important. The teacher could hear them. They spoke to each other over a microphone and, and, um, and speakers. And the teacher's job was to sit at the microphone in front of this panel and to read a series of words, um, to read a series of words to the learner, the unseen learner in the other room, and the learner had to repeat those words back to the teacher. Now, the teacher was told that this was an experiment in seeing um, the effects of punishment on learning. And so when the quote unquote learner made a mistake, the teacher was supposed to issue an electric shock to them. They were told that the learner was, or the, the learner was tied to, you know, some electrodes in the other room. And so it went. Um, so it began. And so the teacher would read the series of words and inevitably the learner would get a word wrong. Now, the trick was they also had to increase the voltage at every mistake. I'll just let you imagine this going on, progressing through this, this teaching experience. Here's what's interesting. If we go to the next slide, Kim Garrett. 
This is what the study found, is that the person who was the teacher kept issuing shocks. This is, again, an actual photo of a participant in, um, of an actual participant in that study sitting in front of that panel that we just saw. You can see the emotion that's happening for this person. They went ahead with the experiment because the experimenter who was sitting in the room with them, whenever the person was getting a little queasy about, I don't think I should be giving the person a shock like this. I think this is wrong. I think this could be painful. I think this is not right. They would ask the experiment. They would turn and ask the experimenter who would just say, the experiment shall continue. The experiment shall continue. Please continue the experiment. They wouldn't intervene. And so it went to, and, and, and the learner on the other side of the wall eventually started to cry out in pain even. The teacher could hear that they were crying out in pain and yet 65% of them issued potentially fatal shocks. Now, of course, fatal is in quotes because I think you're all guessing that the, the learner was in on the experiment. The learners were actually not randomly assigned. They were actors. Um, they were actors to play out the part of someone who was being, who was essentially being fatally shocked. At, at some point, they even went silent. Now, that's shocking, pardon the pun. But we learned a lot from this experiment. Of course, it was an experiment in obedience. We learned a lot about the obedience. But I think we learned something else as well. We learned that having a tough conversation is so uncomfortable for us that we would actually shock a person to death rather than have a tough conversation. That person that you're seeing there on the slide just couldn't have that tough conversation to back away from that panel and confront the experimenter and say, this is not okay. That's how tough, tough conversations are. Let's look at the next slide to find out why. Because tough conversations are deep in the soup of, of psychology for us, of our need to stay connected to others. A tough conversation essentially has the potential to tear the social fabric. I know that's probably a very poetic way of saying what it really is, but we are so hardwired. We are so hardwired to, to stay connected, to have positive social relationships that we are, anything that threatens that is really hard for us to overcome. And a tough conversation can, of course, create a threat. All of those things that you were giving me in the chat and the Q&A, you were, you were essentially telling me how you experience that threat. That's that, that threat. And if you give me another click here, Kim, you can see that I call these social threats. These are all social threats. It's an actual threat, not a physical threat, right? As far as we know, no one's, no one's died from just having an uncomfortable conversation. There, so it's not a physical threat, it's a social threat. It's a threat to your relationships, your peace. Like, hey, you know, I just, I can come to the office and we don't bother each other. It's peaceful here. I don't want to have a conversation that could put that in jeopardy where we're kind of now awkward with each other a little bit. It could be a threat to your reputation, your ego or your status. Some of you are saying, um, there was someone who said, um, I'm, I don't feel terribly secure about my ability to do this. What if I screw it up? What if I, what if suddenly people realize, wow, she's not a very good leader. It could, it could threaten your clarity or your certitude. I, I thought sure that my story, the way I saw this was the right way. And now all of a sudden I'm faced with maybe I'm wrong. Maybe there's something going on here that's bigger than I thought, and I don't know what to do about it. Now, here's what's interesting. I just find this fascinating, and I, I hope some of you do too. What's really interesting about social threats is our brain perceives them to the same, with the same depth of, of feeling as physical threats. Your brain doesn't know the difference between a social threat and a physical threat. It treats them the same. It comes up with sort of the same brain response for both of those things. So now think about that. Like I just gave you sort of the, the, the clues as to why. So Matt, when you said that tough conversations is the suffering that you do in advance, this is the suffering. Your suffering is surely as if you were being physically threatened. I say this all not to paint a daunting picture, but I will tell you this, Courtney was talking about earlier of, of how every time you, you see that there is a course or 
a lecture on, on how to have these difficult conversations. You're like, sign me up because I want to figure this out. You keep trying to ease that suffering. But the fact of the matter is it's never going to get easier. I'm just going to let that sit for a minute. It's never going to be easy. I, maybe I should correct myself. It can get easier using some getting, having some confidence in your skills, but it's not going to be easy. It will never be easy. Um, I oftentimes make the joke that the day you wake up and you think, yes, I get to have a tough conversation today. I can't wait to go have this tough conversation is the day you may realize that you may be a sociopath. It shouldn't be easy. It shouldn't be easy for all of the things that you see here. If you are someone who, 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 um, who values relationships and peace and all of those things that you see here, then this is why tough conversations are so tough. So we can help you out. Let's take a look at some of the things we can do to help you out. What you are looking at here, you're seeing a lot of lot going on. You're seeing an image basically that is describing for you all of the skills and tools that we can offer to help you with this. I will never make the claim that I will make your tough conversations easy. I will never make that claim because for all the things you just saw, that for goodness sakes, human beings have been known to think they shock someone to death versus have a tough conversation. I can't, I can't completely, um, I can't completely dissolve those kinds of things that are true about, about the nature of tough conversations. But what I can do is I can arm you with the confidence that you crave to have these conversations to um, so that they are as effective as possible, as effective and as and, and lowers the temperature for you as much as possible. So let's take a look at what's going on here. And then what I'm going to do for the next few minutes in is I'm going to pull out two of these um, and we'll, we'll highlight those. But if you really want to see all of these things in action and learn about all of the things that you're seeing here, um, please do come and join us. Um, for the deeper course. So you're going to see right away that I divided this, this skill stuff into two categories that maybe you haven't thought about before. One is substantive skills, which you see listed there. And then the second is performative skills. Let me just say, tell you what I mean by that. Substantive skills, I mean, if you think about the term substance, that's what I mean here. They have some serious substance. They go deep. These are deep skills. These are skills that are at the bottom of everything. And I'm guessing that you also might be thinking, humility is a skill? <laughs> Empathy, that's a skill? The answer is yes, it's a skill. By the definition of a skill, it is. A skill is just something that can be learned and you can get better at it through practice. That's the definition of a skill. By that definition, those are skills. You can learn the skill of empathy. You can learn to be more curious and get better at it through practice. And those are the substantive skills that will, um, that will help you to overcome your aversion. Now, the aversion is normal, but will help you, uh, certainly will help you overcome the avoidance of, of tough conversations. So those are the substantive ones. And I'm going to pick on one of those. I'm actually going to draw a humility here in just a second and talk a little more about that. The other set of skills that you'll learn is performative skills. And I argue that these, these are also, these are sort of the take along skills. These are the above the waterline, the skills that people can see. Um, I think performative is the right word. These are the things that you act out. These are the, uh, you know, the things that people can obviously see you using. And we've identified four performative skills that form sort of the, the tapestry of skills that are needed to have a tough conversation. And those are conflict framing, mindful listening, non-reactive empathy, which is the one I'm gonna draw out here for just a couple more, just a deeper look at, and then asking empowering questions. And that term empowering is really important there. Um, we also have on this slide, you can see that we teach some tools, we give some tools, um, a mindset analysis. This is a tool that re re um, reveals sort of a surprising choice that you have about how you show up to do, to partake in a tough conversation. So we do some, we offer some tools around sort of analyzing your mindset and the potential mindset of the other. Of course, there's a conversation prep. Um, I just said one of the things that I learned from my my journey into tough conversations was you gotta, you've gotta prepare. So we give, of course, a, some conversation prep tools. 
as well as some conversation hacks, just kind of the, the short, quick things that, you know, to take along and remember. Um, so we offer some hacks. And then, of course, there's structures and models. Like, how do you how do you really think through the nature of a conversation that is that is difficult? And we recognize that there are primarily two general types of tough conversations. You know, almost anything can be a tough conversation, but generally they they sort of frame themselves around either holding someone accountable or giving someone feedback that they're not doing what they should be doing. And so we offer also some um, some structures that are simplified and based in the principles of coaching um, in terms of models. So that's a lot. Um, it is a lot because that's what we cover if you join us in a full day course on this. Um, but let's just pull a couple of them out for just a quick examination, give you kind of a sense of how we think about this. So if we'll go to the next slide on humility. Humility, I said, is a substantive skill, but it is, it is a skill. Some people tend to think you're humble or you're not. Um, but it's it's a it's a skill that can be looked at, understood uniquely and and new, and it can be practiced. When I talk about humility, and I know you all know what humility is, um, you all have some sense of what that is. It's not this is not um, some completely unknown concept. But what I find when I work on this in the in the classroom with participants is I find that they have a um, a way of thinking about humility that is not particularly helpful to them in, in these moments. They tend to think of humility, and so test this out on yourself. See if you think about it this way. They, they tend to think about humility as like lowering yourself, like bringing yourself down a notch, um, of thinking, thinking essentially less of yourself. Like, oh, I'm just getting too big ahead. I'm just, I think I'm just too big of a deal which is of course why I have this sign over my shoulder that reminds us you're just not that big a deal. That is a lesson in humility for sure. But they lose sight of the other thing that you see here in the quote from C.S. Lewis, which is my favorite definition of humility. It's not, it's not about lowering yourself. It's about just not thinking about yourself so darn often. It's an issue of, of, of frequency not quality. I, mean, I want you to think, I think I want you to think about yourself as someone who is competent and capable. I want you to have high notions of yourself. I just don't want you to think about yourself all the time. And that's the first one of the first tricks about having a tough conversation is you'd be surprised. Again, I'm going to go back, Matt, you gave me the, 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 the quote of the day of the suffering that you do prior to having the conversation, that suffering, I assure you, is coming from the fact that you are so worried about yourself in that moment. So one of the first tricks that I teach, almost a hack, if you will, of having a tough conversation from a better mindset is to just, just force your thinking off of yourself and on to the other person, which, by the way, then gives us a leg into empathy, which is another substantive skill that we dive into. But the first thing to do is just to remember to stop thinking about yourself so often. The other thing that you're seeing on this slide that I find is um, sort of surprising to people who are wrestling anew with this, with this skill that they, they thought they knew so much about is that humility actually has two opposite states. Certainly the first one is arrogance. I, when I, I often ask the question, okay, so what's the opposite of humility? It takes just a second for people to say arrogance or, or conceit or narcissism or some form of, of that. And it, it takes them a long time. Indeed, they almost never come up with the second opposite state, which is too bad because it's it's the more common opposite states of humility. As a matter of fact, I don't I don't I can't tie this to any particular research, but I'm going to guess it's probably well over half of the reason that most of us um, suffer um, and not uh, with with a lack of humility, and that is you're insecure. Insecure people think of themselves all the time. You walk into a room, if you're, if you're really insecure, imagine you're really insecure and you walk into a room, a networking room, and you don't know anyone. What's going through your head? Like, oh my gosh, what are they thinking of me? Did I wear the right shirt? What if they, what if someone asks me something and I don't know the answer? What if I say something really stupid? Oh my gosh, will people know that I don't have a, a graduate degree? What, what, whatever, right? What's all of that, if not just thinking of ourselves? 
That's not humility. That's the opposite of humility. And so you can imagine in those moments now, if you just practice, that's why humility is a skill that you can practice and get better at, of just stop thinking about yourself and look at someone else and wonder what might that person be thinking and feeling. This is one of the first and deepest lessons in having and being more secure, feeling more um, engaged in tough conversations, feeling more prepared to have a tough conversation is to get out of your own head. It's not about you. There's someone else who made the comment about, I'm always worried about the outcome, like forcing an outcome rather than just let the conversation flow. Imagine how the conversation might flow if you're just not all stuck up in your head and worried about what everyone is thinking of you or what the other person is thinking of you in that moment. But indeed you are just thinking of what the other person might be thinking and feeling. It's a very powerful way to approach a tough conversation. That's, the, that's a, a taste of the substantive skills. Let's take a look at one of the performative skills next. What I call a couple of different things. I use a couple of different terms to describe this, this performance, this thing that you do. The first is non-reactive empathy. And I chose the word non-reactive because I want you to get out of the game of strong reactions. Just, you don't have to remember my story of like, I had a strong reaction. Um, I had a strong reaction to what, what the person was saying to me about Jackie. There's just one more thing you got to remember. I had a strong reaction. I want you out of the game of strong reactions. I want you to breathe. Of course, being humble helps you here. And I want you to think about just staying calm. You don't have to react. You can still see the other person. You can wonder what they're thinking and feeling, which is, by the way, the definition of humility. Non-reactive wondering what the person is thinking and feeling. Just wondering. I wonder what this moment is like for them. I wonder what they're worried about. I wonder. I wonder how they're processing it. I wonder what got them here. I wonder what got them to the point that they made this kind of a decision, did this thing that we are now having to have a tough conversation about. I wonder what got them there. And then non-reactive empathy says, I'll do that wondering. And then I will just say, I see you there. I will acknowledge and validate that this is, is, is your suffering, essentially. This is your state of suffering. This is your state of how you got here. It is simply seeing the other person who is temporarily struggling. I just acknowledge, I see you, I see your temporary struggle. I acknowledge that you got here. There's a really key phrase on here that I find a lot of people struggle with. And that is what you see there of empathy is not endorsement. Particularly when you're talking about something I mean, you can imagine, I, and I'm sure many of you have stories that, that we have no time to tell today, but many of you have stories about some pretty outrageous things that people have done that require a tough conversation. And you're so afraid to say to them, I see you struggling. And it's understandable. You, everything about you, understandable. You're just a human being struggling in this moment and you are understandable. They're so afraid to say that because they feel like in that moment, they will have endorsed that person's actions. But this is why it's so important how you show up with this non-reactive, I'm not endorsing you, I'm just saying I see you. And you can then, as a matter of fact, one of the practices we teach is we call this the chapter one, chapter two idea which is chapter one is I see you. Your struggle is real. And frankly, if I had experienced the situation the way you are experiencing this situation and was thinking all the things that you're thinking about this situation, I would have acted and said the same things that you did. It's understandable. That's chapter one. Chapter two is the thing you said or did is not acceptable by our standards and it must change. Now, the reason we do that, and you can see there, it works by creating that space. It creates a moment for them to stop 
wanting to push against you. Stop wanting to armor up against whatever judgments and indictments you have of them. It, it interrupts that pattern for them by saying, I see you and you're understandable and you are nothing but potential, so let's get busy. It interrupts that pattern and it allows them to set, it, it let, I like to say it lets a little air out of the tires. It sets down sort of this overinflated moment and it lets a little air out of it so that we can now talk about what might be better. What's a better approach, which is of course, where you're trying to get with every tough conversation is what might make it better. So Jack, there's a question from the chat and from our friend Tara Marsh. Hi Tara. Um, and I think you just answered it, but if there's more that you'd like to say, or Tara, if there's a follow-up question, I'll just read it. Um, so you just talked about hard conversations. There's an element of holding boundaries for the team, acknowledge and validate that. So in those hard conversation, there is that validation. Sorry, I'm scrolling. Um, but at the same time, how do you hold the boundary around what needs to change? And I think you just described it, which is part two is here's what we need from you. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. And the the um the beauty of it is that it works better. I'm gonna tell you this. Like I I I confess, you know, I confess my tough conversation um pitfalls of I walked into that conversation thinking, I want you to do something different. Why am I having to have these conversations with you? Why are we here? Why is this so hard? With all my judgment and all my energy, I walk in with, to that conversation. It doesn't work. What works better is to lower the temperature, to say, I see you there. You don't necessarily, uh, you don't, you, it's, it's not about agreeing or not agreeing. Your endorsement, your judgment, all of that is not needed here. It's just simply not needed to move these things forward. It's about non judgment, staying out of judgment. It's not about endorsing or not endorsing. And you can be, I mean, you can be firm, you can be tough, you can be no kidding about what you say next. But you can start from a place of humanity. I'm guessing that you're feeling, I'm guessing that you're you're feeling uh, a little bit intimidated or even afraid right now of what might happen next. That makes perfect sense. Totally understandable. I imagine that you're probably pretty angry about how this went down. Totally understandable. Now, here's what I need you to do next. Here's what I cannot have you do anymore. And what I need you to do more of, less of, differently. You can be firm about both of those things. So one thing I want to add right now is I think I have a secret wish that I'm going to say out loud that what Jackie just said is making a bunch of you really uncomfortable. Like, because I started the call by saying, like, we want to make some substantive changes in how you think. What, what Jackie just said, what we teach in this class, we teach in all of our leadership classes, right? Is you have to think differently. And this idea, what we're asking you to do is to hold two very different ideas in your head at the same time, which is I can be empathetic. And what I've told myself all the time is if whatever I empathize with, I agree with. And what we're inviting you, the very different thinking is I can see a human being and I can see their suffering, and I can see their struggle, and I can see their pain, and I can accept it as real for them. And at the same time, hold a different opinion, hold a different judgment, hold a different sense of what I think is right or wrong. And it's our inability, honestly, on, on so many levels and so many issues to hold two different ideas to respect other people's situation, their experience as true for them, that hangs us up in so many conversations. So I hope you're wrestling with this. I hope this makes you uncomfortable. I want this to be tough and I want you to play with it and play with it and play with it. Because when you start to, to hold both of those spaces, I see you and your experience is real. And here's what I think is true or right. And you practice that you're going to get better at it. It's not going to be easy at first, um, but that's where change happens. Yeah. Question, Jack. Um, do you encourage making the feedback 
about the work rather than the person? Mm, oh my gosh, that's a really great question. I'm going to flip things upside down for you here as well. Um, uh, we have a saying around here. We teach it in all of our courses. If you've sat in a course with me, you've heard this coach the person, coach the person, not the problem. The story is the wrong place to focus. I call it the story because it's always a story. It's he said, she said, um, the story is the wrong place to focus. Eventually. Now, let me be clear. I, I, we, there's a, we have, use a framework called progressive accountability. You start with the person you're coaching the person. The person is the one who's got issues that need to be worked out so that they can do the problem better. <laughs> so then go fix the problem. So start with the person. Now you don't have to have unlimited patience or loyalty. If this is a person who's not willing to change, to listen, to open up, to drop their armor, if they are so wrapped around the axle of their grievance that you can't reach them, you don't have all day, all you know, all day. You don't have you don't have years of of, of loyalty and patience with someone who just is not able to open up and make that shift. So with that said, um, you'll coach the person, not the problem. If you can't get them to unwrap through all of that, through all of supporting them, seeing them, acknowledging and validating and asking them for better, asking them for their ideas, asking them where it hurts, asking them what, what's on your mind. If you can't move them, then at some point, absolutely, you do have a business to run. I mean, we're very clear about that. At the end of the day, you do have a business to run. And at some point, you may have to really focus in on that problem and maybe even move someone in to, to fix it for you or fix it yourself, whatever it might be. But yeah, so if you don't have unlimited loyalty or patience, but focus on the person, <laughs> not the problem. We tend to think that focusing on the problem will just make it easier. Like then I don't have to deal with the feelings because the problem doesn't have feelings. Yeah, I wish that were true. If that were true, I'd tell you to do it. Um, but it's not true. You, you don't fool anybody. <laughs> you, you still are going to be dealing with the muck of the feelings with uh, with the person. So that's where your focus needs to be. It's a great question. All right. Yes. Let's go ahead and wrap up. Thanks for that, Jack. I hope there's a lot of questions. Um, it, it brings up some good stuff for you all. What's next? Um, we're trying something new here. Um, for the most part, we teach, and I see a question coming in. We'll get to that in one second. Um, we teach this class to a intact teams, like mostly companies hire us. We come in, we work with your teams. We are going to the tough conversation course. Jackie's referenced it a lot. If all of you are like, oh, I want to learn more. Uh, we're going to try something new, which is offering a public offering of the, of the tough conversation class in Cedar Rapids. So if you, what we recognize in our business model right now is there's companies, there's teams, there's, there's a lot of pull for internal organizations, but there are also individual leaders out there. There are some of you that are sitting on a team and you don't have a, you know, you don't have 12 people to go with you through this class. Um, so we're going to try, I mean, we, we like to try things around here, might work, might not. Um, but offer the tough conversation class where we can, you can dig a little deeper into all of these concepts. You're not going to get just two of the skills, but all of them and really get to practice the courses designed with um, experiments. So you get to actually practice this skill and build it up. Um, and we're going to offer that in Cedar Rapids, Iowa on, let's go to the next slide, May 18th. So we will, you just, to register, just email Kim Garrett. She will help you with the, with the details. Um, we are hopefully going to fill that up. We're offering an incentive to register by April 12th. So we actually have built a couple things, conversation hacks, which are just like your quick go-to tips on helping your tough conversations get better. And then a, a tough talk prep guy, Jackie talked about how, um, she needed to prepare and sometimes preparing is just slowing down and asking yourself some questions before you go into the conversation. So we put them as in a guide for you. You'll get those both for free if you register by April 12th. Um, and I think that's all I want to say about that. Um, we are going to go ahead and wrap up. I'll take the, I have two, two minutes to grab a question. Um, and we'll just remind you to, to follow our stuff. So let me just see. Someone says, don't worry. Oh, hi, Mel. I am going to, answer, I'm going to ask the question. Um, yeah, I'd love to answer that question from you. You've Mel. already read it. So why don't you fire away, yeah. Jack? We just have a minute. 
this is a question about how do individual contributors have hard conversations with their bosses? It's, you know, usually it goes the other way around, but I love Mel that you're flipping it on us. And here's what I'm going to tell you. We don't have a lot of time to go into it, but essentially it's the same stuff. It's the same performative skills. It's the same substantive skills. Here's the difference is you don't have legitimate authority or org chart power to pull some levers. So you can set like, um, when I said like, here's what I'm going to demand, like I'll do the part chapter one, chapter two, you may not have a lot of chapter two power. Like I'm going to go ahead and have to ask you to do something different. You may not have that power, um, but you have everything else. You have everything else. And at the end of the day, it's your choice. If you're going to stay in the situation where things aren't, it, 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 that is just, a, it's the truth of hierarchies. You ultimately are just going to have to make the choice for yourself. If you stay, stay in joy or leave in peace. Um, whereas leaders can leverage some more power um, around, you know, sort of their with their legitimate authority and, and org chart power. Um, that's the only thing that you'll be missing. That's really any different. And it's a big difference. I'll grant you that. It can be a big difference. You can still still set firm boundaries around how you will be treated. Um, but, you, you know, you can't, you're demanding compliance to that. You have, you just have different levels of authority on that. All right. So we're going to go ahead and wrap up. There is a shot cast on tough conversations. So um, if you want to take a listen to that or share it with other people, please do. The recording will be coming out following this. So if you want to listen to us again. Thank you all for showing up, for participating, for asking your questions. Uh, love talking to you about a very tough topic. Everyone have a fantastic day. Thank you. Bye. Bye.